thank you very much. It's great to be with President Macron of France, and we've had a uh, fairly long relationship and a very good one. And uh, we were just discussing certain things, and then we're going to have a long conversation afterwards. I want to, first of all, before we begin, I want to pay my respects to the great warriors that you lost in Mali. Thirteen uh, helicopters uh, was very sad. I've gotten a report on it. Uh, we talked about it, and please uh, give my condolences to the families and to France. Uh, great fighters. You've done a fantastic job in that whole area. It's a tough area, so we appreciate it very much. We'll be talking about a lot of things, including NATO and including trade. We do a lot of trade with France. We have a minor dispute. I think we'll probably be able to work it out. But uh, we have a big trade relationship, and uh, I'm sure that within a short period of time, things will be looking very rosy, we hope. Uh, that's usually the case with the two of us. We get it worked out. We've had a lot of good a lot of good things. We've done a lot of good things together as partners. Our countries have been partners in uh, many good ventures, including some having to do with radical Islam and others. And uh, it's always worked out. So I look forward to our discussion. We made a lot of progress in our first 25 minutes. And we intend to make uh, a lot of progress in our next uh, hour, maybe hour and a half. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Je suis heureux une fois encore de retrouver le Président Trump ici, euh, ici à Londres. Comme euh, il a dit, d'abord, je tiens à le remercier pour ses condoléances et les mots qu'il a eus pour, euh, pour nos soldats. Nous avons rendu euh, hier un hommage national à, à Paris. Nos 13 soldats sont tombés sur le théâtre d'opération Mali. Et merci pour, pour cette solidarité et, et aussi l'implication de vos soldats sur le terrain dans cette lutte contre le terrorisme. Le Président l'a dit, nous avons commencé nos discussions, nous allons les poursuivre. D'abord, sur le plan bilatéral, avec des sujets économiques, commerciaux, dont nous allons à coup sûr une fois encore trouver l'issue. Nous avions commencé à en parler à Biarritz, là aussi, pour ce qui s'agit des taxes sur le numérique, ou des sujets commerciaux et l'ambition que nous avons aussi pour nos économies. Il y a également les sujets qui concernent l'OTAN. Là aussi, nous avons également commencé à parler de plusieurs crises internationales pour, pour nous coordonner. Et il est clair que nous aurons, lors de ce sommet, des discussions importantes, qu'elles concernent d'ailleurs l'implication des différents membres et de l'OTAN en tant qu'organisation au sein de la coalition internationale en Syrie, comme les travaux que nous menons ensemble sur les différents sujets. J'ai eu l'occasion de le dire à plusieurs reprises, la coopération entre nos deux pays, qu'elle soit militaire, économique, diplomatique, est importante. Nous arrive parfois de ne pas être d'accord, on l'a eu sur le climat, mais sur... La lutte contre le terrorisme, sur les engagements essentiels, nos soldats, nos équipes travaillent côte à côte et nous décidons, je crois pouvoir le dire, en partageant cette finalité et nous avons toujours su trouver une solution aux problèmes qui nous étaient posés. Donc je suis très heureux de pouvoir avoir cet échange, de poursuivre dans un instant et surtout de pouvoir faire avancer les choses ensuite lors de ce sommet qui doit répondre à des questions fondamentales pour l'organisation, questions qui n'ont pas été traitées jusqu'à Comment bâtir une paix plus durable en Europe, avec beaucoup de menaces aux frontières, parfois des intérêts Comment aussi agir plus efficacement face à nos ennemis communs, en particulier le terrorisme islamiste Et là aussi, il faut que tout le monde autour de la table soit parfaitement clair sur des définitions, des finalités, et c'est que nous partageons cela ensemble. Voilà. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. President Trump, do you have a better understanding of what President Macron was saying about NATO? Well, we just began discussing NATO. And uh, what I'm liking about NATO is that a lot of countries have stepped up, I think, really at my behest. And also yourself, you're close to the level. Uh, but uh, they've stepped up and they put up a lot of money. I, I told you it was $130 million. $130 billion, and that's a lot. And they're now stepping up again. It's going to be $400 billion over a very short. We have commitments for $400 billion. And we just left the Secretary General, and he, uh, he's got some things that are very important. And 
I discussed with him the flexibility so that we have it not just with one area of the world. You and I discuss this all the time. We have all areas of the world because NATO is a lot different than it was, and now it's certainly a lot different over the last three years. So we have a lot of countries stepping up and putting up a lot of money. Uh, the number as of this moment is exactly $131 billion. That's a year, and that's a tremendous amount of money. But it's not enough. And they also raise and have commitments for $400 billion. So NATO, which was really heading in the wrong direction three years ago, is heading down. If you look at a graph, it was to a point where I don't think they could have gone on much longer. Now it's actually very strong and getting stronger. Uh, many people are committed to that 2 percent, and ultimately, I think the 2 percent will be raised. And uh, the President and I, I think, feel that we need more flexibility, and I think we both agree on that, so that we can use it for other things, not just uh, looking at one specific country. I mean, a lot of people say it was meant to look at, at originally the Soviet Union, now Russia. But we also have other things to look at, whether it's uh, radical Islamic terrorism, whether it's the tremendous growth of China. Uh, there are a lot of other things. So NATO is becoming uh, different than it was, much bigger than it was, and much stronger than it was, because people are now fulfilling their commitments. There are some countries that aren't fulfilling their commitment, and those countries are going to be dealt with. Maybe I'll deal with them from a trade standpoint. Maybe I'll deal with them in a different way. I'll work something out where they have to pay. But, you know, we don't want to have people delinquent. We don't have we, I don't think it's fair for us to be involved, including France, by the way, to be involved and you have countries that aren't paying their way. They, you know, less than 1 percent. You have a couple that are less than 1 percent. Not fair. So NATO has made a lot of progress over the last three years, and the word flexibility is very important. They're not just looking at one area now. They're looking at the world, and that's very important. To me, it's very important. Please. No, I, I know that my, my statements created some reactions and shaked a little bit a lot of people. I, I, I do stand by. And, and I have to say, when you look at what, what NATO is and should be, first of all, this is a burden we share. And President Trump just reminded you some figures. And the fact that this is perfectly true that the US overinvested decade after decade and is number one by far. And I do share the statement. That's why I'm a strong supporter of a stronger European component in NATO, which is exactly what we are doing. So in terms of cost sharing, we are investing 1.9% of our GDP. We are increasing our GDP. We will be at the rendezvous. But when we speak about NATO, it's not just about money. We have to be respectful with our soldiers. The first burden we share, the first cost we pay, is our soldiers' life. And I do believe that in such circumstances, we do pay what we have to pay for collective security. When I look at the situation in Syria, in Iraq, but as well in Sahel, France is definitely present. But my third point is that we have today strategic applications to be, to be done. It's impossible just to say we have to put money, we have to put soldiers, without to be clear on the fundamentals of what NATO should be. And this is not the case today. What about peace in Europe? I want us to have clarification about that. After the decision of the end of the INF Treaty, we have to build something new, because now this is a risk for Germany, France, and a lot of European countries to have new missiles coming from Russia, exposing us. We need such a clarification. And I want a European component to be part of the future negotiations of such a, a new INF treaty. When we speak about the enemy, I would say, of the alliance, what is the objective? To protect our partners against external threats, and France will do it, and we will have full solidarity vis-à-vis -vis -vis Eastern and Northern states in Europe. But the common enemy today are the terrorist groups, as we, as we mentioned. And I'm sorry to say that we don't have the same definition of terrorism around the table. When I look at Turkey, they now are fighting against those who fight with us, who fought with us, 
shoulder to shoulder against ISIS. And sometimes they work with ISIS proxies. This is an issue, and this is a strategic issue. If we just have discussion about what we pay, and we don't have clear discussions about such a situation, we are not serious. We are not serious for our soldiers, we are not serious for our people. This is the very reason of my statement. I do believe we need strategic clarifications. How to build long-term peace in Europe? Who is the enemy today? And let's be clear and work all together on that. I know that we do share exactly the same thing. Having less budget exposure of the US means more European investment and more clarity on the European side. I do agree. Being strict and very efficient against terrorist groups means having clear, clear definition of these groups and no ambiguity. I think we do agree. Well, one thing I will also, I'd like to say that you've been really doing a great job in Africa, and you've been very much involved there, more than most, and that's been fantastic. Uh, I appreciate you saying the United States for decades have been paying really way, way disproportionately too much for NATO, and you'd have other countries paying far too little that are very directly you know, benefited by it uh, and by the United States' involvement. And we're changing that around somewhat, and it's very important. But we're a very important player. I think without us, NATO certainly is not the same thing as we discuss and discuss it at length. This morning, we discussed it with Secretary General Saltenberg. Uh, but we're behind you 100 percent, and uh, all of the money that's been raised and all of these countries that are all of a sudden putting up money, it's a great thing to see. But we do have a great uh, — uh, we really have a different — objective, I think, right now. We're looking at a much bigger picture. And that includes uh, — well, it includes — you mentioned Iraq, but it really includes Iran, too, I think, that if you look at what's going on in Iran, they have <coughs> massive riots. They're having protests all over the country, and they're killing a lot of people. Everybody knows that. That's why they turned off their Internet system, so nobody can find out. But if the — media would go there, and it's, I think, very hard for the media to go there, frankly, right now, but they're killing a lot of people. Uh, but NATO has come a long way in three years, and it's something that uh, we're very proud of, because we're with them. And NATO serves a fantastic function if everybody's involved, if they're not involved. And I really believe that the President is very much involved and likes the idea of NATO, but he wants it also to be utilized properly. If it's not utilized properly, we all agree, right? That's no good. So uh, we've had a very good discussion. A lot of people, and we're meeting with a lot of countries later, as you know, and they're really stepping up. For the most part, they're all stepping up. We have one or two that aren't, and we'll have to deal with them in a different way. Maybe we, as I said, we'll deal with them on trade. We have a lot of power with respect to trade. They make a fortune with the United States, and then they don't pay their bills. That's no good. But NATO's come a long way in three years, and it's become uh, very powerful. I think very, very powerful. And it's become, I think, a much fairer uh, statement in terms of the United States, because we're able to go down a little bit. We were paying 4 to 4.3 percent of the largest GDP ever. Nobody's ever had a GDP like we have right now. And nobody's come close. And other people were paying 1 percent. Some people were paying less than 1 percent of a very small GDP. It's not fair. And if they get attacked, we protect them, but it's not fair. So a lot of changes have been made. Phil, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. President, what is your message to President Macron about America's <coughs> tech company, and what will your process be in determining what additional products from France he might apply tariffs to? Right. Well, we're working on that right now. We all we have discussed it. I think we'll be able to work something out. I hope, and maybe not. Maybe we'll do it through taxing. You know, we can work it out easily through taxing. But uh, the techs, you know, they're American companies, the tech companies that you're talking about, yeah. uh, they're not my favorite people because they're not exactly for me, but that's okay. I don't <coughs> care. They're American companies. And we want to tax American companies, so that's important. We want to tax them. That's not for somebody else to tax them. And as uh, the president knows, we tax wine and we have other taxes scheduled. But we'd rather not do that. But that's the way it would work. So it's either going to work out or we'll work out some mutually beneficial tax. And the tax will be substantial. And I'm not sure it's going to come to that, but it might. That's all right. 
Mr. President, has France committed to step up when it comes to taking back foreign fighters in Syria? Well, I haven't asked that to the President today. I have over the period of time. We have uh, a tremendous amount of captured fighters, ISIS fighters, over in Syria. And uh, they're all under lock and key. But many are from France, many are from Germany, many are from UK. They're mostly from Europe. And some of the countries are agreeing. I have not spoken to the President about that. Uh, would you like some nice ISIS fighters? Look, I can give them. If you look at the you can, take, you can take everyone you want. <coughs> Let's be serious. Uh, the very large number of fighters you have on the ground are as the fighters coming from Syria, from Iraq, and the region. It is true that you have foreign fighters coming from Europe, but this is a tiny minority of the overall problem we have in the region. And I think number one priority, because it's not yet finished, is to get rid of ISIS and these terrorist groups. This is our number one priority. And it's not yet done. I'm sorry to say that. You, have, you still have fighters in this region, in Syria and now in Iraq, and more and more. And the whole destabilization of the region makes the situation more difficult to fix the situation against ISIS. Second, some of these foreign fighters are being judged in Iraq because of the deeds uh, precisely, uh, 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 they acted in this, uh, in this very region. And we will have a case-by-case -case approach. We have a humanitarian approach for children, already organized, and we will have a case-by-case -case approach. But for me, the very first objective in the region is to finish war against ISIS. And, and, and don't, don't make any mistake. Your number one problem are not the foreign fighters. This is the ISIS fighters in the region. And you have more and more of the fighters due to the situation today. This is why he's a great politician, because that was one of the greatest non-answers I've ever heard. <laughs> and that's OK. Because sometimes there are, there is, <laughs> if you can have some temptation from the, U, the US side. I don't say about President Trump, but could be the press, to say this is the European responsibility. I'm sorry to say that. We have some of our people. But if you don't look at the reality of the situation, that is number one. Not to be ambiguous with these groups. This is why we started to discuss about our relations with Turkey. But I think any ambiguity with Turkey vis-à-vis -vis these groups is detrimental to everybody for the situation on the ground. France has actually taken back some fighters. Uh, but we have a lot of fighters. We captured a lot of people. And we have captured 100% of the caliphate, but you know that that means that it's still that they keep going and going. Uh, we set a small contingent in, and we wiped out another portion of ISIS. We don't want to happen uh, to me what happened with President Obama, where it reformed, and then it became stronger than it was in the first place. So we don't want that to happen. And as I said before, we've taken the oil. We have the oil. So we have total control of the oil so that they're not going to be able to use that. They use that oil to, to really uh, to fuel up their wealth, to fuel up their their money, that was their primary source of income. And they get contributions. So we have now lists of where these contributions come from, which is very important. You have people contributing, if you can believe it. Some of these people are wealthy people that make contributions. And we have lists of where we, we learned a lot. You know, when we got al Baghdadi, that was a great get. And when we killed him, uh, we have a lot of information that. Uh, I'm revealing now for the first time, but we also got a lot of good information. So uh, a lot of things are happening, and uh, France has been very helpful. I have to say that uh, they've been very, very helpful. Okay, go ahead. Any other questions, please? Monsieur le Président, le Président américain a eu des propos assez durs à votre rencontre ce matin. Comment abordez-vous ce sommet de l'OTAN et cette rencontre? Comme vous le voyez. Avec beaucoup de pragmatisme et avec la volonté de faire avancer les sujets, comme toujours. Je défends les intérêts de la France, c'est aussi une position européenne. Et je le fais avec le, le souci également d'avoir une relation amicale et constructive avec les États-Unis d'Amérique. Et c'est ce que nous avons toujours privilégié avec le Président. On a une discussion sur l'OTAN, je viens de réexpliquer quelle était notre position. Et elle est assumée. Elle est assumée parce que nous sommes engagés militairement dans des périodes d'opération qui supposent la clarté. Ça a été évoqué. Il y a des sujets, ça a été évoqué par votre collègue américain qui a été révélé hier, celui de la taxe numérique. 
sur ce sujet, je peux vous apporter une réponse extrêmement claire. Le premier, pourquoi on en est à cette situation Parce qu'aujourd'hui, nous avons des entreprises numériques, quelle qu'en soit la nationalité, qui concurrencent les entreprises de l'économie réelle et qui ont 14 points de fiscalité en moins. Donc il y a un biais, pas juste. Nous avons, sur la base de la proposition de la Commission européenne, passé une taxe numérique. Elle ne vise pas du tout les acteurs américains. Les entreprises françaises, chinoises, de toutes les nationalités sont touchées. Elle permet de corriger pour une partie d'entre elles cet écart et de répondre à une nécessité. La France l'a fait avec d'autres pays. Et donc, on aura en parlé, ma première interrogation. Qu'est-ce qui va se passer pour le Royaume-Uni, qui a pris la même taxe pour l'Italie même taxe, l'Autriche, l'Espagne, qui l'ont fait sur la base de la proposition de la Commission. Parce que si on est sérieux, il faudra que tous ces pays soient traités à la même enseigne. Donc, nous sommes là dans une phase qui va rentrer, de discussion qui va se poursuivre dans les prochaines semaines. Et je pense qu'avec le président Trump, nous pouvons régler cette situation. Et ce qui avait été d'ailleurs discuté à Biarritz, et je regrette que cette solution soit abandonnée, parce qu'elle était bien meilleure et pour les États-Unis et pour l'Europe, c'est d'avoir une taxe au niveau de l'OCDE. C'est d'avoir une vraie taxe multilatérale qui permet de, de ne faire aucune distinction, aucun biais, mais de taxer ses activités numériques par rapport au biais qu'elle fait dans chaque pays. On va voir ce que donnent les discussions dans les prochaines semaines. Mais elles impliqueront de toute façon une réponse européenne, car en la matière, pas la France qui serait sanctionnée ou attaquée, c'est l'Europe. Et donc la Commission s'est exprimée ce matin pour apporter son le soutien. Et c'est la Commission européenne aussi qui aura à réagir si il devait y avoir une escalade. Mais moi, j'ai plutôt confiance dans le fait que là aussi, on sera trouvé une solution ensemble. Donc voilà, il ne m'appartient pas de, de commenter tel ou tel propos, mais de vous dire que pour ma part, je suis déterminé à défendre les intérêts de notre pays, à défendre les intérêts européens et à le faire dans le plus grand respect et l'amitié avec les États-Unis d'Amérique et le camp de la liberté. Was making anywhere from 100 to 150 billion dollars a year in deficits to the United States. Uh, they were making it; we were losing it, and so we had to do something that uh, is fair, not severe. I think fair. We're losing tremendous amounts of money. Uh, as you know, the European Union is very strong on barriers. Barriers meaning certain of our products can't come in, including agricultural product. Uh, it just can't come in. We can't sell it, and yet the European Union sells openly to the United States and generally untaxed or taxed at a low level. So these are problems that we're talking about. These are problems that we're working out. And, you know, uh, the digital tax is the least of it. Uh, uh, I inherited a situation where the European Union, which was formed partially for this reason, I guess for a lot of reasons it was formed, but partially to uh, make better or take advantage of the United States. And they've done that very brilliantly. And frankly, uh, it's not right. So uh, I've exposed it. A lot of people didn't know it. And we're doing things about it. We have no choice, because the United States can't continue to lose the kind of money that they've lost over the last, literally since the formation of the European Union. Uh, and I think we'll work something out. Uh, they want to talk, as you know. The new head wants to talk who's uh, supposed to be a very respected woman, uh, very highly respected, and I look forward to meeting her. They want to meet. But we have a very unfair trade situation where the U.S. loses a lot of money for many, many years with the European Union, uh, billions and billions of dollars. I mean, to be specific, a over $150 billion a year. So we don't want to be doing that. And we, we can make a deal, we can take a harsh approach, we can solve that problem instantaneously if we wanted to, but I don't want to do that. These are friends of ours, these are people that we've had very extraordinary relationships with, and I do personally, and I'm sure we can work something out. You mentioned earlier the uh, Iran protests. Does the United States support these protesters in Iran? I don't want to comment on that, but the answer is no, but I don't want to comment on that. Mr. President, on Turkey, uh, President Macron just said he wanted the United States to do more than standing up to President Erdogan and clarifying the terms of that relationship. Are you supportive of those efforts by other NATO allies? Are you standing in the way of Well, I can only say we have a very good relationship with Turkey and with President Erdogan. I do. Uh, I, I can't speak for 
the president of France, I mean, I, we have a very good relationship. Uh, we pulled our soldiers out. We said, you can patrol your own border now. I don't care who you do it with. We're not going to have soldiers patrolling the border that's been fought over for 2,000 years. Uh, but we took our soldiers out. We put some of those soldiers around the oil, where we've captured the oil and taken the oil. And we have the oil. Uh, but we've, and we've brought some home, and we will be bringing some home, and we've sent some to other areas. Okay? Sir, but, but we have a very good relationship with Turkey. Mr. President. I, and just on Turkey, to be clear, we have a lot of cooperation with Turkey. On security, on trade, migration, and so on, there is a full plate agenda with the, the European Union and France. I do respect all leaders, whatever they can say, even bad things about Myself, I do respect. I never insulted anybody. But now the question for this NATO summit: I think we need clarification from the Turkish side. This is not us to qualify them, but and what they are doing. But I, 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 I do believe at least we have two clarifications to be asked. How is it possible to be a member of the alliance, to work with all of us, to buy our materials, to be integrated, and to buy the S four hundred from Russia? Technically, it is not possible. <laughs> Two qualifications to be provided by the Turkish president, as far as he wants to be part. Second, I understand from Turkey that they want to block all the declarations of the summit if we do not agree about their definition of terrorist organization, qualifying YPG and the others as terrorist groups, which is not our definition. These two points have to be clarified if they want to, to be a serious member of the alliance. I think so. Mr. This President, is you? this is really why we're having meetings. Those are our points. And we'll be discussing that with the President today. Yes. Mr. President, will you uh, issue sanctions on Turkey over their purchase of the S-400 missile system? We're looking at it now. And we're talking about it now. As you know, Turkey wanted to buy our Patriot system, and the Obama administration wouldn't let them. And they only let them when they were ready to buy another system, which is not the same system. Uh, but Turkey, for a long period of time, wanted very much to buy the Patriot system, which is our system, which is what NATO uses, which is a great system, which is the best system. But they wouldn't sell it to Turkey. So, you know, there are two sides of the story. I have to say this. Uh, but we will be discussing that with uh, Turkey in a little while. We'll be meeting with Turkey in a little while, and also tomorrow. So, sure. But to be clear about, about this point, and to or you to have them, it's a full overview. They were discussing with the Europeans on Sam PT, <coughs> and uh, we accepted to sell the Sam PT to them. So this decision is not due, and 100% explained by the refusal a few years ago of the Americans not to sell the Patriots. It's uh, their own decision, even having a European option totally compliant with NATO. So they decided not to be compliant with NATO. Sir, uh, Mr. President, Prime Minister Johnson, I believe, is organizing some sort of discussion later today about the Syria conflict. Are you going to take part in that and meet with him? And if not, why? why Are you not? talking about Ambassador Johnson? Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister. Oh, I thought you meant Woody Johnson. No. I said, boy, he's really risen rapidly. Woody. Where is Woody? Is he here? <coughs> he's not here. This is his house. I can't believe he's not here. Uh, yes, we'll be meeting with uh, Prime Minister Johnson in a little while. I'll be seeing him later on. Uh, we're going over to number 10, which is a very exciting place to be, as you know. Uh, and we'll be discussing a lot of different things, yes. And one other related question, the, the London Bridge attack from a few days ago, do you have any comment here your first day? No, I, I don't have a comment on the London Bridge attack other than to say that I was very proud of those people that grabbed them and did such a good job between the fire extinguishers and whatever else. It was an amazing job they did, and he was very violent. You could see that. I mean, this was captured very much on tape. Uh, I think the, the way the, uh, I think they were British citizens, the way they stepped up was incredible. That was really great. So, uh, a terrible thing, terrible attack. A lot of people uh, very badly hurt. I believe three or four killed. Is it four now today? 
Uh, so it's terrible. It's a terrible thing, and I know it's an act of terrorism. It's been declared an act of terrorism, radical Islamic terrorism, by the way. And it's uh, very bad, very bad. But I think the, pe the way they stepped up to me, that was something very special. Okay? Mr. Trump, a question on Russia. Um, Mr. Macron says that uh, Russia sh shouldn't be designated as, um, as an adversary of, of uh, NATO. Do you agree with that? Uh, do you think uh, Russia is the enemy? And Mr. Macron, who is the enemy today? I don't think he does feel that. I think we get along with Russia. I think we can get along with Russia. I think you feel we can get along with Russia. We've discussed that before. But certainly we have to be prepared, whether it's Russia or somebody else, we have to be prepared. But he and I have a pretty similar view on that. I think we feel that we can get along with Russia. And I think it's a good thing to get along with Russia. And uh, I campaigned on it. I mean, I go into big stadiums, people like it. And I think the Russian people would like to see it too. A lot of, a lot of good can come of it. But the purpose of NATO is that, but the purpose of NATO can be much more. And that's where we're showing the flexibility over the last period of two years. Pour être clair sur votre question, je... l'Alliance s'est organisée pour en effet faire face à la Russie historiquement. Je pense qu'aujourd'hui, il faut regarder la nouvelle situation historique et aussi notre géographie, j'ai souvent dit. Je n'ai aucune naïveté à l'égard de la Russie. Et nous sommes très confiants sur les attaques cyber qu'il y a pu avoir, sur les conflits gelés qu'il y a en terre de l'Europe, et y compris sur la crise ukrainienne que nous vivons. Est-ce que le statu quo est la meilleure des options Je ne crois pas. Et donc, nous devons engager une procédure avec quelques préconditions et une méthode. Les préconditions, c'est, on le sait, de savoir avancer sur le conflit ukrainien. C'est ce que nous ferons d'ailleurs le 9 décembre prochain à Paris, avec un sommet en format Normandie, pour essayer d'acter des avancées entre l'Ukraine et la Russie. Ensuite, c'est de pouvoir définir un agenda où... Les Européens, si possible ensuite les membres de l'Alliance, définissent des, des procédures, des définitions de menaces communes avec la Russie, de coopération possible, en tout cas des escalades. Ça prendra du temps. Mais je pense que si nous voulons, d'une part, la stabilité en Europe, d'autre part, réduire la conflictualité, il est important d'initier un dialogue stratégique avec la Russie. Il faut le faire sans aucune naïveté et il faut le faire en étant conscient aussi du poids de l'histoire et de la peur que certains pays européens ont à l'égard de la Russie. Et je le dis ici en ayant beaucoup de respect et d'empathie pour ces derniers, à l'égard de la Pologne, des États bas, de certains États nordiques, la Roumanie et quelques autres, nous savons que ce qui est attendu de nous, c'est aussi de les protéger à l'égard de, de potentielles agressions. Et donc, dans ce cadre-là, nous devons apporter de la visibilité pleine et entière sur les protections que l'Alliance et en son sein l'Europe peut leur peut et doit leur apporter. Et la France y jouera tout son rôle. Enfin, si je pense qu'il y a un ennemi commun, c'est le terrorisme international, et en particulier le terrorisme islamiste. Soyons clairs, c'est ce qui nous conduit à agir ensemble au Levant, dans le cadre d'une coalition internationale qui est aujourd'hui née sur responsabilité américaine, mais où l'OTAN est engagée en tant qu'organisation. Et comme vous le savez, la France est très présente. C'est aussi ce qui nous conduit à agir au Sahel contre ces conférences. Monsieur le Président, on, on sent encore déterminé que est isolé sur la scène européenne, parce que vous avez parlé de la peur de la Russie, mais aussi la peur, il faut le dire, des États-Unis, de la part de certains de, de vos voisins, euh, qui se disent on ne peut pas avoir à la fois une, une défense européenne forte et être dans, dans l'OTAN. Je sais que c'est ce que vous essayez de dire. Vous essayez de dire on peut avoir fromage et dessert, c'est l'expression qui, qui est revenue. Comment vous arriverez à bouger les lignes, sachant qu'il y a des situations politiques un peu compliquées, y compris chez vos voisins les plus puissants en Allemagne, en Italie D'abord parce que ce n'est pas fromage et dessert. Ou alors c'est un petit steak. Parce qu'en l'espèce, ce dont on parle, c'est d'avoir une Europe qui investit plus dans la défense, qui permettra de réduire l'investissement américain. Donc c'est parfaitement cohérent. Mais après, c'est un, un rapport à la souveraineté et à la puissance. Il est légitime que les États-Unis d'Amérique nous disent aujourd'hui, pour protéger vos frontières européennes, pour aller régler vos conflits de, de voisinage, qui sont votre voisinage, vous devez être plus investi, vous devez payer davantage, vous devez investir davantage. C'est légitime. 
Et donc, nous ne sommes pas dans une situation de sortie de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale où il faut bien le dire, l'Europe était désarmée et où une partie des Européens ne voulait pas du réarmement de certains Européens. Je pense aux Allemands. Et nos mentalités ont été construites pendant des décennies où l'OTAN était d'ailleurs fait pour que certains n'aient pas accès à une souveraineté militaire. Les camps ont changé. D'abord parce qu'il n'y a plus de pacte de Varsovie. J'ai cru comprendre que le mur de Berlin était tombé, ça fait quand même 30 ans. Et il y a aussi, depuis plusieurs années, des États-Unis d'Amérique qui nous disent « Prenez vos responsabilités ». Nous Je ne suis pas aussi pessimiste que vous. Ces deux dernières années, on a fait avancer une coopération renforcée, un fonds européen de défense, une initiative européenne d'intervention dont tout le monde nous disait qu'elle était impossible. Maintenant, il y a chaque mois des nouveaux membres. Les huit membres historiques étaient présents le 14 juillet à Paris. La Grèce nous rejoint, l'Italie nous rejoint, et ça continue. Et donc les choses avancent. Il y a une vraie dynamique. Et elle continuera d'être là. Et elle se fera, je dirais, de manière totalement intégrée avec le temps. C'est une ambiguïté qu'il faut lever à l'égard de certains autres qui ont peur. Ça ne suppose pas de se livrer aux menaces extérieures ou de se désarmer. Au contraire, ça veut dire une Europe qui prend ses responsabilités au sein de l'Alliance pour alléger la charge des États-Unis d'Amérique et pour porter sa part de Je D'avoir une discussion maintenant stratégique. On va commencer à la voir. On a parlé avec le secrétaire général Stoltenberg. On en a parlé avec. On a commencé à en parler avec le président Trump. Mais il est clair que nous devons assurer l'ensemble des pays de l'Europe, et je pense aussi à ceux qui sont à moins de 500 km de la frontière russe, mais ce n'est pas couvert par le, le traité étrémique, de ne pas être exposés à des armements russes. Et donc, il nous faut, nous, clarifier la position commune que nous souhaitons prendre. Les parties prenantes à un nouveau traité, c'était jusqu'alors un traité bilatéral, je souhaite que l'Europe prenne ses responsabilités, qu'à la France le fera, qui, comme vous le savez, est une puissance dotée, et que nous puissions ensuite, une fois cette coordination faite, engager un nouveau dialogue, un nouveau débat avec les Russes pour répondre à ce problème de sécurité et de désarmement sur notre, notre propre sol. And I think the situation in Ukraine is very important. I think that uh, the meetings coming up with Russia and Ukraine are very important. And there's a possibility that some very big progress can be made. It's very important for Ukraine. I think it's very important from the standpoint of Russia also that they work out a treaty, they work out peace, <coughs> because they've been fighting a long time, too long. And I think there's a really good chance uh, that that will happen. Also, with respect to nuclear weapons, uh, I've spoken to President Putin, and I've uh, communicated with him. And we are, he very much wants to, and so do we, work out a treaty of some kind on nuclear weapons. That will probably then, then include China at some point, and yourselves, by the way, but it'll include China and some other countries. But uh, we uh, intend to see if we can work something out to stop the proliferation, to stop uh, what's happening, because we are making a lot and we are renovating a lot. And uh, frankly, uh, the whole situation with nuclear is not a good, it's not a good situation. We ended the treaty because it wasn't being adhered to by the other side. But they want to make a treaty, and so do we, and I think it would be a great thing. I think it's one of the most important things we can do, frankly. So uh, we're going to be dealing with Russia on a, uh, a treaty where we really and, — and we're focused on nuclear and nuclear weapons, missiles, but nuclear weapons. And we think something could be worked out. We think they want to do it. We know they want to do it, and we want to do it also. I spoke to China about it. Uh, they, during one of our trade negotiations, they were extremely excited about getting involved in that. So some very good things can happen with respect to that. It, I think it's very important. The whole nuclear situation, very, very important. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.